I am on staff here at the Atlanta History Center. Today we are doing um, a veterans uh, history project interview with Newell Brian Tozer. Um, today is November the 13th, 2003. We are at the Atlanta History Center. Newell, will you tell me your name, your birth date, and birthplace? Yes. Um, I am Ellen Newell Brian Tozer is my married name. And I was born at Old Piedmont Hospital on December 15th, 1933. Mm -hmm. Almost 70 years. <laughs> Can't believe I'm a veteran. <laughs> How can it be? <laughs> um, uh, where were your parents living when you were born? Do you remember? Yes, of course I do. Um, my father and mother did over a gorgeous house, number 217 15th Street in Ansley Park that belonged to Daddy's grandmother, Mrs. William A. Wright. Mm -hmm. And they say they started the renovation of Ansley Park. And they did it over when they married and made it into a duplex. And I was thinking back today because Edwin Lockridge died today. And the Lockridges bought it. I promised and lived there. At any rate, Daddy and Aunt Mary Bryan, his only sibling and his sister, inherited that from their grandmother when she died the year Mother and Day were married. And they got Heinz Adler and Schutze to do it over for them, so it was lovely. And that's where I came home to from Piedmont Hospital. And you were the oldest of? Three children. Three my children. sister Mary Lane was born in December of 36, and my brother William Wright Bryan Jr was born in September of 1940. And by that time, by September of 1940, we had um, moved out to live in Nine Iron Pops, my grandmother and grandfather's house on Clifton Road. That was and a tell beautiful. Us who Pops are. Ellen and Alfred Newell. Okay. And um, they had bought a, a, one of the original cottages down at Sea Island. And so they were spending maybe six or eight months of the year at the beach. And they were very grateful when Daddy and Aunt Mary sold 217 15th Street and we needed a place to live. So I went to kindergarten at Spring Street School and then I went to first and second grades at Druid Hill School. And then my mother decided that uh, she wanted her children to grow up with all of her friends' children. And so, uh, when Billy was one year old, and that was September of 1941, we moved to 2513 Peachtree Road, northeast. And that's now part of the gates. It was um, three houses north of Lindbergh Drive on that side of the street. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me where I grew up, I would say there. Because we walked to E Rivers, and we walked to church, and. Um, Which church? I come from what they call a mixed family in Alabama, <laughs> Brady Hill. I, my mother was a Baptist, so we went to Second Ponce Baptist because she took us to Sunday school. And Daddy was a Methodist. <laughs> and he went to First Methodist. Anyway. Um, but you would walk to Second Ponce. Well, walk to Second Ponce. Walk and north on Peachtree to Second Ponce to our, and walk uh, south to E. Rivers. To school. E. Rivers. And Mother never did a car group for anybody except Billy. <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, that's where I, I grew up. And, I, and what, was, what was your dad doing? Daddy was a newspaper man always. And um, he graduated from Clemson. You know, both my mother and father, I need to tell you, are native Atlantans. Mm -hmm. And they were both born in their grandparents' homes in Atlanta. Mother by the state capitol and daddy across the street from St. Louis. And um, daddy came to work for the journal after one year at the University of Missouri, journalism school. He graduated from Clemson in 26, and then his grandmother gave him a year at the University of Missouri Journalism School, and then he went to work for the Atlanta Journal as a reporter. Do you want me to turn off the video, and do you need a Kleenex? Are you okay? You can do that for a minute, turn it off for a minute, because it was emotional. I've had a lot this week. Anyway. But, um, after a short break, we are headed back. Um, Newell is going to catch us up. You were talking about your, both your parents were native Atlantans. 
your dad was born in across uh, from St. Luke's Church, church and on mom, Peachtree Street, and, and he was mom, so proud of it. And your mom was born at Five Crew Street, over by the State Capitol. State Capitol, mm -hmm. okay. And then catch us up in the story there. Well, um, Daddy came to work for the Journal. Uh, his grandmother, Mrs. Wright, owned 217 15th Street. And she went down to Major Cohen at the Journal and said, give my son a grandson a job, and he did. And Daddy did very well. And um, he lived with his grandmother at 217 15th Street, then inherited the house, and he met Mother, and they married. What did they meet? Clemson, no, they, they met in Atlanta. Oh, okay. Mother was always in Atlanta, and okay. they met here, and they courted for about two years. And it was the Depression, and they didn't have much money at all, so they couldn't get married for two years. And um, at any rate, they married October 12, 1932, uh, and they were to have been married at One Clifton Road, my grandparents' home. But it turned very, very cold that October 12th. So my grandmother used to cry about this because she would cry and say, I never thought I'd have a daughter married in a golf club. They just moved the whole wedding across the street to the Druid Hills Golf Club. It was right across the street from their home. And everybody would say, well, it took. The wedding took. So anyway, uh, they were married there. And they went, they, oh, they flew to New York on their honeymoon. They were among the first people in Atlanta to fly. They flew Pitcairn Airlines to New York, which took them something like eight or 10 hours. And then they went to Bermuda. The, Daddy had what you call a due bill from the journal for Pitcairn Airlines, and they flew free. And um, they went, stayed at the Waldorf, and then they went to Bermuda on a boat. And they were having such a good time that they missed the boat coming home, and Daddy had to wire his boss have decided to stay over. <laughs> he was afraid he would lose his job, but he didn't. Uh -huh. Anyway. Um, what sort of things did he write for the paper? Well, he was, was, this was, the he was by this, it was the Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta when there Journal. were two papers. He was employed by the Atlanta Journal. What yes. was he writing for them? Well, by this time, he was city editor, mm -hmm. which means he was bossing all the reporters in, um, in charge of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he was city editor. That's pretty good. Uh -huh. And um, then... He, he always kept up his, uh, he was a second lieutenant because Clemson was a military school, you know. In those days, it's not now, but it was a military school until right after the war when they got counted. Kind of, and he kept up his commission. He would go out to Fort McPherson every summer and stay two weeks or something, keep up his commission. But he had some minor health problem. I don't really remember what it was, but a very, something minor that wouldn't, let the Army take him as a second lieutenant in World War II, which he tried to do. So by this time, in December of 1939, Governor Cox had bought the Atlanta Journal and the Georgian and killed the Georgian. He hadn't yet bought the Constitution. And, and all of this happened. Governor Cox bought it the week of the Garden with the Wind premiere. And Mother and Daddy were all involved in that. Mother was in charge of the ball. And, um, Daddy was afraid for his job again. But he and Governor Cox became great friends, and Governor Cox really became his mentor. I have letters from Governor Cox. And, and so Daddy went to Governor Cox and said, I want to go abroad as a war correspondent. And he convinced Governor Cox to let him go for the journal. So in September, of 1943, mother and daddy went to New York. Daddy was accredited as a war correspondent. And Governor Cox had an apartment in the Waldorf. And um, mother and daddy must have been there 10 days. Mother was there. Mother was there. We stayed with Nana and Pops at One Clifton. And um, before daddy sailed with a convoy. And um, it took him two weeks to get to England, and Mother, of course, came home. But I think they had a good time before he left, and every night they would go up and have drinks with Governor Cox. <laughs> and then he, Mother said he would dismiss them, and then they could go out and go to play or something. And what were you doing at? I was at school then. You know, this is September of 1943, before D-Day. Are you um, at E-Rivers? No, no, I was at 
Druid Hills for first and second Druid grade. Hills. So this is then. Okay. No, I beg your pardon. You're quite right. This is 43, and we moved to, you're right, we moved to 25, 13 Peachtree in 41, September. So I was at E. Rivers, but Nana and Pops looked after us. But at any rate, uh, I didn't think much about Daddy going. The greatest thing Mother ever did was she didn't let us be afraid. Mm -hmm. And Daddy promised her that he would be home by Christmas. He left in September, and he said, Ellen, I'll be home by Christmas. But then... Um, the preparations for D-Day began, and he was in England. And there's a clip in here about the first Sunday he was in London, that um, Sunday in London, like a visit to an Atlanta park, and this is the first Sunday he was in London. And he says it's just like going to a crowd like you'd see in Piedmont Park or Grant Park. But he followed the crowd to Buckingham Palace, and there he saw the king and the queen, three, anyway. You know, he got so, having so he a good time, and, and he realized that big things were happening. Preparations for this big invasion were happening. So he convinced his mentor, Governor Cox, and the journal, what I mean, Governor Cox was the owner. Mm -hmm. He convinced the powers that be at the journal to let him stay until the invasion. All right, now down here there's a copy of another clipping. It says London College. What is that? Yes. Um, my father always, when I was growing up, had a weekly radio program. You know, um, the journal owned WSB. Still does, I'm sure. But at any rate, um, WSB started in the journal's building and it owned it. And uh, Daddy was wonderful on the radio because he had a a wonderful voice. So he had a weekly radio program here in Atlanta before the war, and it was called Views of the News. And when he had it on a certain day, I think, of the week, and it was around supper time, and he would interview famous people who came to Atlanta that week, and it was a half an hour program. And um, Mother would always say, right, if they're really fun, interesting people, bring them home for supper. Anyway, he had that program in Atlanta, so he continued it in London. Now, one of the big purposes of his going to London that fall of 1943 was this, was to interview Georgia Boys in, in England. And if you read, I have my sister, Mary Lane Brian Sullivan, did a wonderful, wonderful thing for her, our family, uh, and this is a co copy of this book she made um, of his columns, his broadcasts. His, no, these are his broadcasts from the war. And um, he went over there to interview Georgia boys in England. So this one, for instance, tells about his get-together with Bobby Jones in England during the war. And, um, and, and Bobby Jones came. He and Daddy were friends from Atlanta. And Bobby Jones came and was interviewed on Daddy's radio program. I reread it last night. Mm -hmm. And, um, for instance, uh, I had the clipping at home and, and told this to the Austins recently, that he, he was at uh, Lucille and Jimmy Austin's wedding. They were married in London before D-Day. And Daddy went to that. And, um, and then he writes in here, in one of these radio broadcasts, about Gone with the Wind, had been playing for four years in London. It never stopped playing. And he interviews a film critic in London about why it was so universally beloved. So, but he went around to the different Air Force bases and Army and Air Force bases interviewing Georgia boys for the journal. And that's what his columns would be about before D-Day mm -hmm. and preparations. But I mean, the censorship was so tight that you couldn't write much about the preparations, I don't think. Mm -hmm but it was the human interest story of Georgia boys. And so, so each week you all would, would you all gather around? Oh, yes. To listen to this, and it was just once a week, is that right? Sometimes twice a week, sometimes. oh yeah, various times. And then, it wasn't just WSB. In those days, Lillian, um, we didn't have television. Uh, but WSB was always a part of, it. I think always a part of NBC, and so, Daddy became what you call a stringer for National Broadcasting Company. And um, they would pick up 
not always on just his Georgia interviews, but when it was a bigger sort of thing that would pick up, particularly after the invasion, the Normandy invasion, they picked up on his broadcast all the time. Do you remember, how did you, um, if you're at home listening to your dad on the radio, mm -hmm. um, did you feel, or uh, did people think that he was a star? Did you feel like you were... Was there... Everybody knew Daddy in Atlanta. I mean, in those men a lot. special. I mean, yes, did you, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But you see, in those days, we didn't think it. In those days, because it was the capital of Georgia, we thought Atlanta was a big city. Not like, but uh, in those days, everybody knew everybody. I mean, it was safe for Mother to let a little girl go downtown almost. You know, I mean... Um, it was a small town in those days, and people would come up all over town and say, I heard your father last night. Oh. And we regularly listened to the radio, our family did and other people did, the way you regularly listen to, say, the news on television. I, I still am addicted to the radio. I'm a radio girl. But anyway, yes, everybody listened. And everybody in town knew Daddy, because <laughs> he was from here. Uh-huh. They were saying, I heard your father last night or yesterday or whatever. It was heartwarming. Um, so he didn't, doesn't come home for Christmas. No. Do you remember that Christmas? Anything about I it? I think, think so. No, I'm, I'm not really sure that I do, except that in looking back on it, I know Mother was brave. Now, I know that you want to talk about Atlanta during the war, and I do have some memories of Atlanta during the war, even though I want you to know it's 10 and 11 years old. Well, why don't you tell us those <laughs> memories? Let's do that, and then I want to get to um, your dad reporting on D-Day. Sure. So let's do Atlanta first. Okay. Well, first of all, there we were at E. Rivers, and we had, and Ms. Osterhout was principal, and she was wonderful, and I remember every teacher I had at E. Rivers. Spell her name. What's her name? Osterhout. I'm bringing pictures of her. Osterhout, H O U O S T E R H O U T. This is Osterhout. She was famous. And uh, Miss Boyd was my third grade teacher, Miss Sarah Clem Boyd, and she was a funny old lady. And uh, I can remember air raid preparation uh, drills. They were called drills. Air raid drills that we would have mm -hmm. at E Rivers. It was the old E Rivers, not the current one. It was E Rivers before it burned down. Those we the same location. From the same location, yeah. but oldie rivers. Mm -hmm. And I can remember that we all marched out to the hall by our rooms and sat in the hall for these air raid drills. And the, I can remember every song we sang. What was, what, how did you know to go into the hall? Did a siren go off? Or did Something it? like that, but okay. it was Miss Miss Boyd told us we had to, <laughs> and she was strict. So, so you went out. So we went out. We sat in the hall, and we sang songs like "Bluebirds Over the White Cliffs of Dover." You know the Air Force song. We sang all those songs, so I still know the words. Uh -huh. And anyway, um, then I don't know whether you know or not, but um, we had blackouts in Atlanta. And living on Peachtree Road, I don't know about other roads, but probably everywhere, we had blackout curtains, and we couldn't turn on a light at night until the blackout curtains were down. And Mother was the air raid warden for our block. And that meant that when we had a drill, or whatever it was, an air raid, she marched around the block to be sure that everybody had their curtains drawn. And what would the block be? Would the block would have hills? been Lindbergh. I think she went up to Lindbergh to the corner of Lakeview mm -hmm. and down there by the duck pond. Mm -hmm. And Wiki Oliver Chambers lived down there and all down there and up down around Peachtree. And we were right next door to the Conleys, Sally Pat Conley. And, mm -hmm. Conley, and then she married Judge Moore. And anyway, that was our block. And, she, and the Shippens were at the corner. You won't believe it, but the Shippens had a cow during World War II. They kept it. That's how small Atlanta was. Mm -hmm. We didn't think so, but they kept a cow in their front yard. Mm -hmm. That was the block. So uh, if they were two doors, were they uh, each tree close to no, the they were. Or? The Shippens were up at the corner, um, I think, of Lakeview, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. of Lakeview. Peachtree and Lakeview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the corner. Uh, Fresh Mill. 
fresh milk. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember so much. I remember that um, we had rationing, and everything was rationed. And Mother was very proud that she didn't ask for more than an A card, which was the smallest amount of gasoline that you could get, A card. And so therefore, um, she would save the gas uh, to do two things, um, go to the grocery store once a week, she would do that, and take us to the doctor if we got sick, or then my grandparents if they got sick. You know. No, I don't, I think maybe a plumber or something like that. But, um, but the funny story about the car is that, and this is a little aside, that um, Mother said that her sanity was saved during the war because a group of them had a war widow's poker club. And they got together every Saturday night and played poker. And it was the only time in her life she ever played poker. But Mother said just to get out with some grown-ups was sanity saving. At any rate, she would drive herself to the get-together. And she, she said she, she rushed her gas for poker night, but she said she could never decide whether to leave the car in the front yard where people could siphon off the gas, because gas was stolen by being siphoned off. It was that precious. Or to drive it down into the backyard, which was way down the back, to the garage, where she said, I could have been attacked by Jack the Ripper. And she said she could never decide which to do, and she used to alternate between backyard or front yard or whatever. But gas was rationed, everything was rationed. Butter was rationed, sugar was rationed, shoes were rationed. We were growing children at those days, and so Mother said the way she managed that was my grandmother was desperate for butter because she was old-fashioned and she liked to make a cake every weekend. And so she would call up Mother and say, Sister, I've got to have some butter. And Mother would bring her her butter coupons and Nana would give her their shoe coupons because they could get along without those. But, you know, I, I never felt really deprived, but I knew that these things were precious. And we did do things like, as children, I remember saving chewing gum wrappers <laughs> because they used to come in tinfoil and chewing gum wrappers, uh -huh. and we rolled them up into balls, and then we saved 10 cans and mushed them down. And that was part of the war effort. All of that, I remember saving you know, all of that. Did you ever take it somewhere? Mother did. My mother did. Mm -hmm. I don't know where she took it, but she took it. Mm -hmm. Saved it. Um, you know, we, we definitely knew there was a war going on and felt a part of the war effort. And I was a brownie and a Girl Scout always. And the troop met up at Second Ponce de Lynn. And, um, you know, the Browning Troop went out to Lawson General and did things for the soldiers out there. Where's Lawson General? Oh, Lydia. Yeah. Uh, it's out by oh, Ogle Park. Uh, I know. Oh, all right. Lawson General this. Hospital was uh, out by Ogle Park University. And it was a big army hospital. And uh, it was, I guess it was sort of in Quonset Huts, but it was, it was a huge army hospital. And my father was in it after the war for a while, or went out there for treatment. Mm -hmm. And, and it was at the end of the car line. And what would you oh, do when you went out? Oh, we would entertain them, of course. <laughs> what else do brownies do except entertain them? Were you singing or playing? Yeah, that sort of thing. Put on plays and, you know, uh -huh. we had wonderful brownie leaders. Uh -huh. And uh, Ms. Ellis and Ms. Merriweather, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and we'd put on plays and entertain them. And, whatever, sing at Christmas. And mm -hmm. We uh, had a good time, but we knew it was the war effort. Some people have talked about um, soldiers coming to eat meals on Sundays. Did that? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Did you all have? We did better than that. We did even better than that at my house. Um, after, shortly right after Daddy left to go to England, Mother said that this lady was a real club woman and a real boss. And she came up to my mother at some luncheon, where they both were a civic luncheon, and she said, Ellen, now that Wright is gone, you have an extra bedroom. And she said, oh, we are desperate for rooms in Atlanta 
for wax and for people during the war. And she said, Mother said, this lady always bossed her around, and Mother just, Mother was a boss herself, but she took it. And she said, I want you to have two wax come and live with you. So I, I, we were paid for it, but still. So Mother came home and rearranged things, and her bedroom and Daddy's, the master bedroom, had a huge walk-in closet and a private bath. And then there were four other bedrooms on that floor, the second floor of 2513B Street, with two, or three, two other baths, one, two other baths. Anyway, mother moved out of her bedroom and moved into the guest room on the front of the house. And she and Billy were on the front of the house and Mary Lane on the back and gave her bedroom with its private bath and the walk-in closet she made into a kitchenette for the kitchen, I don't know, I guess, for the wax and oh. put a little place, a hot plate there where they could make breakfast. And so we had Captain Morris and Lieutenant McLean living with us all during the period Daddy was away. And rereading these letters from Daddy that my sister put together, bless her heart, um, in one of the first letters from Daddy, he says, I'm not quite sure how I feel about those wax being in my bedroom. <laughs> Anyway, we became great friends and corresponded and kept up with them for years after the war. Okay. So we had our war effort, mm -hmm. and that was fun. And, and you know, it gave grown-ups in the house with Mother, which was good, too, because she'd never been in a big house alone. Let's go to um, D-Day. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story. Um, your dad is a reporter, and how does he end up on a plane to go over and see the invasion? Well, a stroke of great good fortune. Uh, as I understand it from hearing him tell about it over the years, um, the reporters who were in England and wanted to cover the invasion, uh, and I guess all of them did, had some sort of lottery or something where they drew out their assignments. And my father was very fortunate. Uh, he drew out the assignment of flying over with the first troop train, plane, excuse me, plane, mm -hmm. to drop paratroopers on Normandy. It was just a stroke of luck. And uh, he had uh, flown over the first Allied paratroopers to land in German-occupied France today met only scattered small arms fire from the fields. Right, Brian speaking from London. Uh, this is a copy of his radio broadcast about it. And you're pointing to um, which is the, front in page of the, newspaper. the front page of the Atlanta Journal, the extra edition. In those days we had extra editions for special occasions. Mm -hmm. And so so the journal used his radio broadcast as a, as his story. And um, sure. And um, he um, my mother was called but this was, my mother was telephoned at something like 2 or 3 a.m. by WSB radio, and she always had friends. We always went down there with Daddy for his broadcast, so we knew the people. And somebody called up Mother and said, Ms. Bryan, D-Day is on, and Mr. Bryan is going to go on there in five minutes or ten minutes with the first broadcast about it. So I happened to be spending the night with my grandparents, and by this time, Mother moved them over to West Wesley Road to the the Grady's duplex, because they were elderly and needed to be close to us and no gas. And so uh, they lived in half of the Grady's house. And I was over there with them spending the night, and Mother called up her parents and me, and we got up, and my grandmother called her sisters. And we got up and listened. And it was very, very thrilling. I mean, we listened at 2 or 3 a.m. when he was live broadcasting about it. And um, well, how did he end up doing why, why did he broadcast it? I mean, what happened? How'd... Well, he, he flew over with these paratroopers, mm -hmm. the first to land on Normandy. And then, and then he flew back to England and he so he's typed back his London. back. No, yeah, he is in London, I guess. It's somewhere in England. Oh, okay. I think it's back maybe a base out from London. But at any rate, um, he, he's always said this, I remember distinctly, that he had written and he could write well and typed up, he'd written and typed up his story about the invasion 
and he had it approved by the census everything that they wrote in those days even letters to us had to be approved by the censors and it was he he was ready the census had approved it he was ready to go on the air with it uh, before they were ready to put on this canned record with Eisenhower who was the head of all the forces then and Churchill and Roosevelt and the King of England announcing in their voices, you know, each one said a few words, a sentence or something, that D-Day was on an invasion of, of Europe had begun and Daddy's was approved. And no one else, no one else, no other reporter had a story, an eyewitness account of D-Day at that time. And so all the other networks, and there was CBS and Mutual, I remember those, all the other radio networks and no television, you understand, pooled and used my father's eyewitness account as what they put on the radio. And it went on the radio for all that day of the 6th of June. And, you know, people called up mother, and in those days we didn't use long distance much, but they called up mother from all over and said, Ellen, I'm listening to Wright. And um, Governor Cox sent her three or four dozen American Beauty roses, and she took them to church. <laughs> Gave them out to everybody at church. Anyway, it was a very exciting day. And um, uh, did you get in the paper too? We did, and I think this was in on the day after D-Day, and this has been blown up by Clemson University for something they did about Daddy. But this is... Uh, a posed picture, but it's very true to form, of my mother and me, I'm the oldest, and my sister and my brother Billy Bryan listening to our father and mother's husband on the radio at 2513 Peachtree Road. And the cat? And the, the cat and the dog, the whole family. And somebody on the newspaper told mother that picture is so corny, it's good. <laughs> anyway, that was the day after D-Day. I think it was in the newspaper. And so we move on about the war, and um, he, he did go back to France, and um, we could look it up in these columns, who he was, which branch of the service he was with. He had certainly very exciting times. At one point, he was with um, Hemingway somewhere. And this is a book that I've just reread, and I'm going to leave here at the History Center for, because um, I've just got a second copy of it. I'm going to leave it here at the History Center for the exhibit if they want it. But it's by John McVeigh, who was a wonderful NBC newsman, too. And he writes about when my father and he were with Hemingway somewhere, and Hemingway misbehaved. Ooh, he misbehaved. But, uh, it's a good book, and he includes a lot about my father in it. Right, so um, your father goes to France. He goes to France, and he, he and John McVeigh, and John McVeigh plays this up in this book, were in the first car, I think this is right, I know it's an early car, the first car of war correspondence to enter Paris on August 25th, 19. 44, the day of the liberation of Paris. And that was a very exciting time to listen to Daddy's broadcast because I think it was Sunday dinner or something. We were all, I remember, we were all together. My family was all together having a meal. And um, we turned on the radio and we didn't know it was coming on and there was Daddy talking about the liberation of Paris. And the thing that was rather, was really frightening is that um, they hadn't gotten rid of all the snipers. Um, and so my father was shot at. And, uh, and my father was very tall. He was six feet five. And you could hear the French girl saying, oh, qu'il est grand, qu'il est grand. And, and then you hear it was, he would say where they were. They were near Notre Dame. And then you hear these, their snipers in Notre Dame still. And the, then they would break off for a while. And then 10 minutes later, they, it was exciting. But were you scared? Yeah, I was a little scared that day with the fire. Was so she was, all of she was very brave during the whole thing, very brave. And I think the bravest that she was was later on, because um, my father and three other war correspondents had gone up to uh, Nancy. It was near Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y, France, to cover what they had been told was a mass surrender 
of masses of Germans. And they got waylaid. They would in a jeep driven by a driver and three war correspondents, and they got waylaid and ambushed, is the word I'm looking for, down a road, and it turned out to be Nazis. They were dressed up in the uniform of the French resistance, but it turned out to be German soldiers. And my father was shot in the leg, and that wound never really healed all during the time. They were captured, and one or two of them escaped. Fortunately, one of them got the story out. Ed Beatty got the story out to the newspapers, and um, that so Daddy was okay, that he was shot in the leg. He was shot in the leg, and was he held as a prisoner of war? Yes, he was, and my father was a prisoner of war from, that was about October of 1944, until I just read this again, February, and he was mostly spent his time in Poland, in uh, our flag 64, it was a camp for officers, I think, because a, a war correspondent had the simulated rank of an officer. And um, so he was mostly in the hospital there in that camp, but they never operate on the leg because he didn't have a dog tag with a serial number on it because correspondents didn't. And so they didn't know how many tetanus shots he'd been given. So anyway, so after the war, he spent some time in army hospitals having that leg fixed up. Mm -hmm. But uh, somebody at the journal who was a joker called mother and said, Ellen, there's no such thing as the fleshy part of Wright's leg. But that was where he was shot. <laughs> anyway, because he, was so thin. he was so tall and thin <laughs> in those days. But um, he was, I think this story says that they were liber, here it is, Wright, Brian, free and well. And the date of this is February 19th, 1945. And it was very exciting. Mother never, mother never gave up hope. She said her friends were afraid he was dead and really were very much afraid he was dead because she didn't hear much directly from him. She went down, there was a president of the American Red Cross named Basil O'Connell, and my mother went down to the hotel where he was staying downtown and camped out on his doorstep until he'd see her and asked him to wire through the, uh, to, to find out about my father, and I think he did. But at any rate, it was very hard that he didn't have a serial number to go through the channels about where he was. But he was liberated by the Russians and taken, uh, and some Russian nuns gave him his first bath and uh, taken into Russia and then down to the Black Sea, and they sailed from Black Sea to Marseille, France. and. Then he got to Paris, and in, in Paris, he met up with a good friend of his from Atlanta, Colonel Bill Plummer. And Colonel Plummer, fortunately, was head of Orly Air Force Base and took Daddy under his wing and got Daddy in the first general hospital in Paris, and Daddy spent several months having the leg operated on and fixed up in Paris after the war. Anyway, it was very, very, very exciting time to grow up mm -hmm. and um, tell us the story about the, is it the ghost writer oh it's a it, it, yes when I was 11 years old uh, this is a picture of me on my 11th birthday I think because that was my birthday dress uh, it says blazing emblem for prisoner the ghost corps insignia is awarded to Wright Bryan the courage of a journal war reporter now held in Germany is lauded. Uh, they came out, uh, it says that uh, the journal war correspondent, Wright Brown, now prisoner of war, today had the right to wear on his shoulders the coveted mysterious insignia of the Ghost Corps, in whose vanguard he rode during its plunge across France to the Moselle River last summer, that was after D-Day. Ironically, the blazing insignia of the 20th Corps was to have been presented to Mr. Brown a few days before his capture near Chaumont, that's near Nancy, France, September 12, consisting of a double X on a deep blue background. The insignia makes him an honorary member of one of the most driving columns of fighting men in the Allied armies. It goes on, Mr. Brown was one of the most popular war correspondents of the Ghost Corps, and his absence from the award formation was extremely noticeable, General Collier wrote. 
So his fearless and determination to forget all, to get all the facts, despite his ever-present danger, deserve the highest praise. Captured four months ago. Right? The insignia given to him and the letter of honorary membership in the Corps have been turned over to his wife, Mrs. Ellen Newell Braun, 2513 Beach Street Road, to await his safe return. And I'm, I'm confident that the reason had mo that mother had me receive it is because it was my birthday. But it must and be what? Be how old? Eleven. Eleven. I was eleven. And, uh, and I always wore uh, this pen. I frequently wore it on a dark suit or something until recently. This pen that is the emblem of the ghost school. You know that? That was part of what they gave us at the time. But. Um, what are the other medals that you have? Well, the most significant one. If you could um, mm -hmm. hold them up yeah. and we'll. The most significant one is the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest award a civilian can receive in this country. And this is the United States of America Medal of Freedom. It's really see. And, 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 and President Eisenhower presented this to my father in Washington in 47. The war ended in 45. And here is a picture of, in 1947, General Dwight D. Eisenhower presented Brown with the Medal of Freedom, which the most significant one. Uh, this is this is just what he wore on his sh uniform as a war correspondent. He did wear a uniform as a war correspondent. Mm -hmm. And um, then this is a, he frequently wore this. This is I don't know who gave it to him, but this I think he got it at a shop in France himself. This is a some emblem of a prisoner of war. The Bob wire shows a prisoner of war. Uh, he went back to France five, every five or at least ten years on the anniversary of D-Day. And once on the anniversary of the liberation of Paris, he went back to France. And um, it was heartwarming. And, but, and these are, I don't really know what they are, but they're French medals that were presented um, to war correspondents war correspondents who had been uh, involved with the liberation of France. And then this one I think is lovely. And it, it was presented to him on maybe the 10th anniversary of D-Day. And it says, Victoire de Normandie, it's French medal, which was struck for that. And it names the town saint mary Glise, Bienville, Caen, Cherbourg, Juin, Juillet, 1944. I later spent a year in, in France shortly after the war and uh, came to love the French people. And, and then you've got one other. Oh, and this one is French. And it's, it says, uh, in recognition, en reconnaissance, for, for his service to his. This is during prisoner of war. This is for his service to prisoners of war. And this is presented by the International YMCA. Now, there's one thing that um, needs to be said, and that is that uh, when he came home from the war, everyone asked my father, was he mistreated? And his reply was always, if you call starving us mistreating, yes, we were. And he made the flat statement that he would not be alive were it not for the Red Cross food parcel. And so, of course, the Red Cross picked up on that, and he was glad for them to, and he became chairman of the Atlanta chapter, and he went all over making speeches for the Red Cross. He, went, he really went all over Georgia making speeches about his war experiences, too, and somebody, lots of people wanted him to run for governor, but he was never interested in politics. Do you know what was in the Red Cross parcel? Any idea? Yes, I think there was some chocolate. I know, I remember, I remember he said that there was some chocolate and things that wouldn't perish. There were non-perishable food supplies because they had to be sent from Geneva or somewhere. Tell us about um, uh, your father is, uh, when, when did you realize he was in the hospital or when did he come home? What was sort of a, your most vivid memory of his 
being freed or coming home? Well, one of my most vivid memories, Lillian, is that um, is this uh, right, Brian Free and well, in the same paper, I think I couldn't put my hands on it, getting ready for this, but it was in the very same day that it was announced that he was free. Um, there was a list in what we call agate type, it's that teeny weeny type, of all of the prisoners of our flag 64 who were freed. And there were a lot of them, and there was a list. And mother had gone out for dinner. I can see where I was sitting right now. And the phone rang, and it was this lady from Asheville, North Carolina. And she said, someone has told me that it's in tonight's Atlanta Journal that my husband is free from our flag 64 and it's in the paper tonight. And I went and I got the paper and I found her husband's name. And I read it to her. And she sent me the most beautiful jewelry, and I still have it, to thank me for telling her husband was alive and well. Those memories, you know. It was, they used to make this dogwood jewelry out of silver in Asheville. And it's a bracelet and a ring, anyway. People were very tied together because it was the wives of those men who had written my mother and said, my husband wrote me that your husband came into our flag 64. So that's how she really knew he was all right. And then a funny story, a really funny story that's an Atlanta war story. We lived right across the street on Peachtree from the stories. You know, the story twins, Margaret and Winifred and Cornelia. And so um, they had a shortwave radio in the prisoner of war camp that was hidden from the Germans. And the Germans would have forbidden it if they'd known them. I mean, they would have punished them or something. But at any rate, when Daddy came into the camp crippled and was in the hospital, he received in the hospital in the camp what German camp, what he thought was a social call from one of the officers in the camp, American officer, who was quite high up in the camp. They had, you know, the hierarchy in the camp. And he started talking to Daddy about all these things and asking baseball scores and stuff like that. Daddy had been there maybe a week or something before he came to call on Father in the hospital. All these things that my Daddy could answer. And then, he said, you say you're from Atlanta. Do you know the Fred story? And my father said, yes, I live right across the street from him. and told him their children's ages and everything. And with that, that night they let my father hear the shortwave radio when they knew he was not a spy, that he was not planted there as a spy. He got in on listening to the shortwave radio. Small world. There's just... Mm -hmm one or two minutes left. Is there anything that you want to say to sort of sum up everything or um, no. you know, any other stories that we have? Oh, so many, so many. I guess we haven't mentioned, have we, that here's the one about, oh, my father wrote a column for the newspaper after the war. He wrote a column five days a week, and that brought him to prominence, too. And he became editor of the Cleveland Plain Dealer the year I was a senior in college. We moved from Atlanta to Cleveland. He was there for 10 years. Anyway, um, my sister is still there. Um, oh, he wrote a column, and this one's about Gone with the Wind. He and Margaret Mitchell were good friends on the newspaper, and she came to our home on Peachtree Road the day he was captured, because it was headlines in the paper the day he was captured, a German prisoner of war. And she sat in our back hall. I wonder where these notes are now, because Mother always had them under her bed in her precious papers. And she wrote down in what we call a journal pencil, this soft pencil type. She wrote down everybody who called and notes about them. And, you know, wonderful notes, Miss So-and-so called and said so-and-so. But they, And she and Mother had gone to Washington Seminary together and were great friends. I, I guess the, the summary would be that World War II made my father into not just an Atlanta figure, but a national figure, an international figure. Best song. Thank you. Thank you.
was gone. Very quickly, you were going to tell us a story about Sea Island and World War II. Well, as I think I mentioned, my grandparents bought one of the early cottages down there. I think it was the year I was born because they said it was the high tide of their life when I was born in that high tide. And we were able to go down there in spite of gas rationing because my mother's beloved friend, Aunt Edith Parry's husband, had some gas for his business. And so he drove us down, half of us, and then half of us went on the train, the day train. So we went down there during the war, but there was barbed wire on the beach. I think people need to remember that. And you couldn't go to the beach at all after dark. And there was a blackout down there too. And we always loved to swim in the ocean. But frequently, there was oil on the water from the German submarines that were sunk down there. And of course, there's been books. I know of one. I think I've got one that was written about that submarine war down there during the war. And that the Germans really could have come ashore you know, on our beaches down there. And we did have to behave ourselves and not cross the barbed wire after dark. We weren't allowed on the beach after dark which was hard on us, but in the summer, because we were, I'm talking about summer. Nana always gave it to us for a month. But, um, and, and then we rented the house to Navy people, because there was a naval base, I think it was naval base down there in Brunswick. Yeah. And so we rented it to naval people, and then mother had to go down there and straighten it up because they had rim it, and you know, I mean, people who rent houses don't take care. But anyway, but, the coast was very much, of course, involved in the war. That's what I remember about the war down there at the beach. Mm -hmm. But we still went. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.